Hello, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests. It's wonderful to be here at Ithra, my first time, and I think first for many, yes. uh, and a pleasure to be sharing the stage with our guests who you can see sat with me here. We have Dr. Mohammed Alhaji, Director of the Behavioral Insights and Nudge Unit, the Ministry of Health, Saudi Arabia, and at the end, we have a, he's, he's had his coffee today, you'd be pleased to know, he's very excited to be here. It's Professor Paul Dolan, who is the Professor of Behavioural Science for London School of Economics in the UK. So today on this panel, we are going to be discussing the psychology of technology. We'll be discussing how it affects our well-being and impacts our behaviour, as well as how vulnerable we are to the risks inherent to its use. So I'm going to get straight down to business and I want to throw this to both of you. You know, how is technology impacting our everyday lives? I take a shot. Paul. Am I starting? Okay, good. Well, thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Um, it, no, it is an honour to be here. Um, it's a super question. I'm going to talk for the next 21 minutes and 52 seconds about <laughs> it. Um, I'll try and keep this brief. Had a lot of coffee. Intro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, it's a boring answer, but it depends. I mean, the, the answer is on how we use it. I mean, it's a bit like markets, right? Markets are not immoral or amoral. They just are organized by individuals and by societies. So the way that we interact with, with uh, tech is exactly the same. It's about how we use it, not what it is. Um, and also, of course, how it is being designed by the architects of the tech to be used in certain ways. And I know we're going to get into some of those issues about how it might be harmful. So the, the more benign answer is it depends on how we uh, use it. I think a general observation, and I will try and keep this very brief, is that it most likely acts as a magnification of what's in the human condition already, I think. Um, it makes us more impatient, because we're impatient creatures anyway. Um, now, you can access things in a heartbeat, um, we want, I mean, think about the power of the tech that you can load up and use in seconds, less than that, is making us increasingly impatient. I think it makes us um, probably uh, a little more polarised. Mm -hmm. So we naturally have an inclination to be drawn to people that are like us and like us, um, and to push away people that disagree, much as we might state otherwise. Um, the creation of echo chambers is one obvious example of that with tech. Um, I think it makes us uh, a little more greedy. I mean, if you look at how people access dating apps, you can literally swipe past hundreds of people um, very, very fast. It commoditizes uh, people. Um, and I think it creates an impression of ourselves, particularly in the ways that we engage with social media, that are not always or even the real representations of who we are. Um, we create, all of us have stories and narratives about the people that we are and the people that we like to present to the world. And I think social media in particular offers us the opportunity to create those narratives. That we all are happily married, in a big magnified. house, having the best holidays. That exactly, kind of exactly. Very few people are posting images of themselves being miserable. miserable. <laughs> um, and actually, of course, much of the time, most of us are, um, especially if you have young children. Um, so... <laughs> I don't see very many miserable parents on, online, and I know lots of them in the real world. So um, I think that's true. But it is worth saying, and I just want to caveat and just make this my final observation, that every single wave of technology has been met with, oh, my God, this is the end of the world. Um, I'm not quite old enough to remember the wireless, but when radio first came out, it was like this would be the end of books. Like, no one will ever read anything ever again. And, of course... People do still read. So whilst um, tech has many downsides, um, it's not necessarily a force for bad. And again, to restate what I said at the top, it all depends on how we use it. And if you allow me, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. If you allow me to pick on what Paul was saying is, um, I think one cornerstone of the psychology of social media and tech now is the uh, changed uh, definition of self-worth. So basically, uh, self-worth uh, needs to be internalized, uh, needs to be within your inner 
life and your inner emotions. However, what happened after social media and all this tech revolution is that we kind of outsourced our self-worth to uh, outsiders, to comments, to likes, uh, to, to retweets. And, and this, this just puts so much pressure on you to increase your addiction and use in social media because you need the validation from outside, which I think it's a game changer with social media. I, I kind of disagree with Paul in that um, it's, he, he doesn't want to be an alarmist and he's an optimist, but I'm on the opposite, opposite side. I think uh, the change in psychology that happened after social media, mostly in the perception of self-worth and self-image is very catastrophic. Now, for example, I don't know if you know these accounts or, or this trend of going to cafes or going to shops <coughs> just to take pictures of these shops to portray the image that you belong to a cool young class that goes to cafes and, and even borrow different retail shop uh, bags to take pictures of to post it. People collect those bags these days. Yes, people collect it. Uh, people buy these uh, bags. They, they, there's a business about it out there. So basically, I want to go back to the self-worth. That's number one, I think, that the, the main threat of social media. Second, in my opinion, is the immediate gratification, as, as Paul was uh, alluded to. So now we live in the moment. We live uh, to, to gain as much attraction and acceptance and validation now in the moment that we lose sight of the past and we can't envision the future of ourselves. We are so immersed in the moment that we really don't plan our future very well because we're all about gaining uh, gratification. Are, and yes. Are, are there other risks inherent to it, Steve? You know, you've touched on a couple of them yeah. there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, think, I, I think the immediate gratification. Uh, the externalization of self-worth, that number two. And I think there is the illusion of knowledge. I, I call the illusion of knowledge in that now with, with, with the huge consumption of information uh, on Twitter, Snapchat, you think you know more. You think, and I, I emphasize here think, because it's, it's a horizontal knowledge uh, 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 accrual. It's not, you're not really going vertical in any of the topics. So it's like going to a fast food restaurant and having a, a burger and you feel satisfied for a couple hours, but that's really junk. And what I feel like, and I might be really harsh about social media, because uh, I, know, I know the world there, you think uh, you know more about X, Y, Z, but really uh, you're just on the surface. We're all on the surface. And that's the threat, another threat of social media, is the opportunity cost. Social media, we all have 24 hours. If you spend five hours, which, <coughs> which basically, uh, based on this study, uh, uh, I think 30%, one third of Saudi population spend more than five hours a day on social media. That means it's five hours away from real knowledge sources. But we're not saying that the technology is necessarily bad or good, and I guess right. it is how we're going to use it. So Correct. what are the best practices moving forwards with that then? Yeah, um, so I'll leave it to you, Paul, now. Well, I'll pick up No, I'm just still stuck on this I disagree with Paul line. I can't, I mean, that's still like in my mind. I haven't heard a word you said since then. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm completely, I'm, 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 You're very I'm completely perplexed. I, I, I don't know what the hell is going on. Um, no, of course, I mean, I'm trying to be, uh, I'm trying to be, be, an, be an optimist about these uh, things because I think uh, we can, use the tech as a force for good. I do think it is worth, I mean, it is worth picking up on that point again about the designers of the technology because uh, it's very telling that many of them won't let their own children anywhere near the kinds of applications that they're pushing mm. on us. Um, so I think that's quite insightful into the whole addiction problem. And I completely agree with everything. It's, hard, I mean, it's, it's impossible to take issue with, with, with any of that. So it makes it all the more important that as individuals we... Uh, learn better about how to engage with tech but also as societies we intervene in ways that regulate sometimes markets I mean we do it with every market right we don't just allow markets to essentially do what they want we have laws and legislations and regulations in place um, that limit the extent to which addictive products <laughs> are available to us um, and I and I suspect we, we, we need to do something I don't uh, suspect, I think we do, need to do something similar 
with our interactions, particularly with social media, particularly with young people's interactions with social media. I mean, one of the things that you'd expect an academic to say is that we need more evidence, and we do need more evidence, because we have very few randomised controlled trials to actually show the causal effects of these um, kinds of technologies on people. But there is some suggestion amongst iGen, this is... Uh, people who've got mobile phones before their brains were fully developed. See, because even the millennials were at a point at which their brains... It takes to you about 25 for your brain to fully develop. Um, we're at the point at which their brains were almost, you know, grown. Uh, we're now in a generation where young people are having access to addictive technologies mm -hmm. much, much earlier. And there's some suggestion that we're seeing increases in self-harm, mm -hmm. in... Um, in depression and anxiety amongst young girls. Again, it's not causal evidence, it's just an association. Um, but that would be the more pessimistic take on what I've been trying to say. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it comes back to, I think, we need to have a serious and grown-up conversation about how societies regulate markets. Um, I'll, just give, I'll, just, I'll just spend a moment just telling you about why I don't think individuals can do it for themselves, always. Um, we're often not the best forecasters of our own well-being. Um, there's a really cool econ study where um, people were asked to come off Facebook and they came off for like two or three weeks or something, reported being much happier from not being on Facebook. So they had the direct feedback that it was good for them not to be on Facebook. Then at the end of the study, they're asked what they'd be willing to pay to go back on again. Now, of course, what they ought to say is, no, you'll have to pay me because I realise this is making me happier not to be on there. But on average, they were willing to pay about $80 to go back onto something mm -hmm. that they had the feedback was made them feel worse. So it's just a very interesting question for someone who's interested in happiness and well-being research, what it is that makes people drawn back into something that they've got the feedback themselves is making them feel worse. And obviously it's something about the fear of missing out, everyone else is doing it. So it is a collective action problem. It's mm -hmm. not something that we can do for ourselves, by ourselves. Well, in terms of technology affecting our behaviour and, I guess, um, our decision-making process, you gave the example there. I've got another one for you. Elon Musk um, put out on Twitter, he did a poll basically asking users if they believed Twitter adheres to the principle of free speech, to which over 70% voted no. Uh, and he was responding to a Twitter user who'd asked him whether he'd consider building a social media platform consisting of an open <coughs> algorithm, an open source algorithm, and one that would prioritize free speech and where propaganda was minimal. What are your thoughts on that in terms of how it makes us think, being drip-fed something and enabling you know, the community into herd, thin herd thinking? Uh, I think that'll just create another echo chamber, uh, just like what the Trump wanted to do is to create another social media for Republicans in the States. That'll just attract and self-select uh, some sort of uh, people and personalities over there, so they'll, they'll have their own bubble to live in. Uh, Elon Musk, the same thing. Uh, I, I believe if this ever goes forward, uh, they're just going to be uh, uh, an echo chamber, uh, which even promotes further uh, uh, herd mentality. Yeah. And, and that's, that's one of the pressures that social media exerts on us, is the uh, freedom of thinking. Now we have a freedom of expression we could express, uh, and like no doubt that social media has provided a platform for uh, to vocalize your issue. However, do we really are we really independent thinkers in social media, or are we going with the herd? I would argue that um, we were most likely going with the herd in a groupthink mentality in an echo chamber that we follow the people that are like us and have the same opinion and ideology as we do. So all we do in social media is am amplify our own opinions and thoughts. And that's my concern about Elon Musk initiative. I'm going to touch on something now, because we've got about eight minutes left in this panel. And I know you're both very, very passionate on this. And it's the ethics of tools and nudges and behavioral science. So you know, you know, how important is it to be aware of that power to control people's behavior for the better? Okay. Are we immune from any lawsuits here? No one's going to tell. Okay. No, we are, we, we are what live. happens in Ithra stays in Ithra, okay? <laughs> so, uh, 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 dark patterns. That's the, that's the term that we need to emphasize here. Dark patterns. is, is the way that uh, social media platforms manipulate our use based on big data that they collect. So basically, if they know that you're into sports, 
or you're into something, then th they get you into there. And I think that one, one, the number one violation there is the lack of transparency. And Facebook has a huge blowout about how they uh, turned users into guinea pigs in, 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 divide, in defining algorithms that increase our interaction with Facebook platform, which translates into uh, more ads and, and more purchase and, and, and more just basically the bottom line for Facebook. So they were not really transparent about it. As, as long as you're transparent, and I think that's the cornerstone of, of any ethical practice, is that users are aware of the design and they could opt out. These are the two things that need to be present in each platform. Well, you talk about opting out, and I'd like to bring Professor Paul in at this moment. And you were involved in something with, with Sage at the beginning of the pandemic. Can you explain, first of all, to the audience who might not be familiar with Sage, what they're about and you know, what you found from the advice they gave at the beginning of the COVID-19 breakout? Yeah, thank you. So, I mean, it, so it's worth saying I'm not, I have nothing to do with Sage personally, um, uh, <laughs> thankfully. Um, what is Sage? I think so Sage is the advisory body on the pandemic, essentially, to the UK government, um, based, made up principally of modelers. So they have different subcommittees. So the modelers and the epidemiologists, and they have the behavioral science subcommittees called SPI B, uh, part of Sage. And one of the it's very explicit and very clear in some of the documentation that you can read minutes of meetings that took place in March 2020, so right at the start of the pandemic in the, in the UK, where it was explicitly recommended that um, levels of fear, perceived levels of fear and risk were increased in population groups that were at that point less afraid. Um, the general public had actually, many members of the general public early on had recognised that COVID had a very significant age effect gradient. Uh, that was much, much more serious and dangerous for, for elderly people. Um, and so it was explicitly stated that we ought to make younger people more scared, basically. That's the kind of punchline. Um, and I think that's an illegitimate use of the behavioural sciences, so for the reason that you mentioned before, transparency and honesty. Um, we can nudge people in particular directions, but we have to nudge them in ways that are truthful. And it would have been a legitimate thing to say, of course, to young people that your behaviour is having significant consequences for older people. That would have been honest. But to say that they are, they are directly personally at uh, risk themselves is um, a lie. lie. And, and what's interesting is, of course, you might have some effect in that particular intervention for that mm. particular outcome. I mean, they certainly weren't motivated by ill intent. Mm. Um, but for me, it starts undermining the mm. enterprise mm. because once there's one example of it being used in ways that are illegitimate, i.e. by lying to people, then it starts to undermine the whole enterprise. And the transparency is important, the public buy-in is important, mm. the acceptability of these interventions has to become important. Um, all of these things get undermined if we start nudging people in ways that are unethical in the sense that we're um, essentially lying to, lying to people. And it's, it's very interesting because they don't have to lie or uh, be a, a Coverts about it because people, even if they know they're being nudged, they're okay with it. And then most likely they will follow suit in the behavior that you ask for. So there's nothing wrong about nudging uh, as long as you come clean and transparent and even telling participants that you're being nudged for the common good, for your own health. I don't, I don't anticipate people don't like, be resistant about being healthy. So if you, if you inform public about that we're doing this and that because of, of public health and the common good, uh, even though they know they're being nudged, they would probably appreciate that. What trends did we see come about during the pandemic, Paul? Yeah, interesting. I mean, I, I think um, <laughs> that our abilities to be able to interact with one another virtually mm. probably made some of the pandemic me measures much more palatable to people, right? We couldn't have done much of what we did mm. even a decade or two ago, certainly, or three, you know, because people wouldn't have been able to interact with one another. So I think it might have given people a kind of false sense of security, a false sense of well-being. Mm. Um, because I say that because we know that there's nothing that's a substitute for face-to-face -face interaction. I mean, the fact that we're even here now having this kind of conversation in the way that we are makes it very different to how we would have interacted on Zoom. Yeah, yeah. because I would um, be in my phone. Because then you'd be on your phone the whole time. Yes. And Professor Paul would be in his shorts, as you yes. said. He yes. always does the Zoom chats in shorts. I'd be in pants, yeah. I'd be <laughs> in pants. Shorts, yeah, shorts. Um, yeah, yeah. Why would I wear trousers on Zoom? Um, so I think that there's nothing 
that is a substitute for face-to-face -face interaction. That's where I want to be a bit more positive about the doom and gloom. For someone who smiles so much and is so happy, hey, you're a very pessimistic man. Um, so <laughs> we can use social media, we can use technology as a facilitator of face-to-face -face interaction. That's what we need to think about how we design environments to make that more likely, mm. um, rather than as a substitute for it. I agree that much of how we're using it at the moment is as a substitute for real-world interaction, but it's not beyond the realms of possibility for us to design environments that, you, that, make, that, that use technology as a way to create relationships, to create conversations. You know, you can, it is true that it magnifies things and it's an echo chamber and all those things are absolutely true. Of course, it also gives you the opportunity to find deviants like you, right? So if you're an odd person, you're not the only one that's odd, you can find a whole community of them out That'll there give you peace. on the internet, right? You can realize that you're actually not that weird, right? So again, it can facilitate some more diversity um, rather than heterogeneity. So I, I, am, I am broadly, I'm broadly, not necessarily optimistic, but it's a moment in time opportunity, I think, for us to think about how we can regulate, legislate, intervene, train and educate in ways that enable us to use technology for improvements in health and well-being rather than to be harmful in those ways. Do you think we have the skills and the knowledge to design the better technology? I think so, yeah. Oh, and there, there's, You're yeah. optimistic now. Yeah, see? <laughs> You nudge me. <laughs> Half an hour on stage <laughs> with you is all it took, Professor Paul. Uh, so I, I think so, yeah. There, there's been nice initiatives uh, uh, from uh, a policy level, uh, from uh, organizational level, neighborhood level, school, individual level. So there are success stories out there. Uh, and I think this, this moment here at the, uh, the, <coughs> the Think Summit, I think it'll bring this conversation live, even makes it conscious into uh, the mind of policymakers and public alike. Because I do believe that as individuals, we do have some leverage on our use on social media. And if, if, if you follow some behavioral things, which we could probably have a breakout session on, that could, uh, that could limit or really enhance your experience as a social media user. Because most of people here, I, I anticipate, are individuals. They're not policymakers. So uh, I, I want to be really optimistic, Paul. They're all we, their do, phones. Okay. we do have control or some, some, some keys that we could leverage to improve our experience. Gentlemen, thank you. So I think you're going to continue the conversation yes. backstage. Uh, I'm staying on the stage at the moment. Ladies and gentlemen, right. esteemed guests, please put your hands together for thank Dr. You. Mohammed and Professor Paul. <coughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.